This is Stephanie from the Yale Alumni Association here back again for another Yale Alumni Live as part of our pep rally series, which is to celebrate all things Yale football, cheer, precision marching band, and everything that makes the game such an amazing experience for Yale and friends. And so we are here today with my friend, Nate Lowry, who is based out in California. So Nate was quite the guy. He played football for the Bulldogs for four years. He has experience in the NFL. And then he's also been on Shark Tank with his really awesome invention for athletes. So we're going to talk to Nate today about his experiences both at Yale and beyond. And Nate, thank you so much for being here with us today. It is awesome to see you. So we're just going to get started. We're going to talk about Nate's experience at Yale. So Nate, tell us where, where you grew up and why you chose to come to Yale. That's a great question. So I actually grew up in the Midwest. I'm from Indianapolis. And yeah, um, like most, uh, I grew up, I grew up in a, a Catholic school uh, Catholic program. So like most uh, kids from Indianapolis that played football, uh, I dreamt of going to Notre Dame. Um, <laughs> but uh, actually, when I was going through the recruiting process, uh, the Yale coaches came out and started showing interest. And yeah, um, I had always taken academics seriously. Uh, hadn't really thought about the Ivy Leagues until, until I started getting recruited um, and ended up coming out for a visit to Yale and it just felt right. Um, you know, the campus community, the architecture, the, the history, the tradition, you know, that is uh, Yale uh, really spoke to me. And I mean, it's, it's kind of the birthplace of uh, American football uh, and what play, better place to kind of continue my playing days um, get a great education and then, you know, set myself up for the rest of my life. So, um, yeah, after, after that initial visit, it was, it was kind of a, a no brainer. So Nate, one of the things that I always talk to people about during Yale Alumni Live is they introduce themselves and they say, and I was a member of X college, the best college. So which college were you in Nate? And was it in fact the best college? I was in Deport and yeah, I would have to say it's the best college. Uh -oh. And I don't know, I don't know about anybody watching, but I wouldn't fight Nate on that topic. So I guess Davenport wins today. <laughs> yeah, so, so Davenport had the advantage. Um, so I uh, met the, the girl that's now my wife, uh, my freshman year at Yale, um, and she was in Pearson. And the, the best part of the whole situation is there were tunnels um, underneath Davenport that led to Pearson. And I could, you know, in the, the, the heart of winter, when it was minus 150 or whatever it was out there. Uh, I could just go out my door down the little stairs through the creepy uh, tunnels, which are now, you know, redone and immaculate. And there's all kinds of like, it's like a city down there. Um, but back then they were just creepy, um, but I could just pop up and we could hang out. So um, yeah, that was a nice, nice feature of being in, in Davenport. That's the Yale charm you were referring to when you went on your tour, right, Nate? The charm, yeah. <laughs> the creepy, creepy tunnels. Yeah, they, didn't, they didn't take us down in the tunnels, but um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> so tell us about what you were involved in while you were at Yale, other than being on the football team. I believe I read somewhere that you also competed in track and field. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Um, I did track my sophomore through senior year. Love that experience. So I was a, I was a thrower in high school, um, you know, was third in state in both shot and disc and really wanted to continue that just because I love doing it um, and love being part of the track team, kind of individual sport. Gives you a different experience um, and you have different bonds with your, your teammates there. And um, yeah, it was awesome. I, I love being part of the track program. Uh, one of the things I didn't realize going into that was that every two years they compete against, they yell and Harvard team up and compete against Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and it's swapped. So, you know, one year it'll be hosted in like New Haven. Uh, then two years later, it'll be hosted over in the UK. Um, and so when I was, I think after my junior year, we went over uh, to the UK, uh, went to Ireland and then, you know, into England um, and had, had some track meets. That was awesome. So, so much fun. So yeah, it was, was involved with quite a bit. That's incredible. That sounds like such a great time. We don't really hear too much about that. So we'll have to uh, dive deeper into that with some other uh, Yale athletes. So tell us what it was like to be on the football team, to play in the bowl, and, and some of your favorite memories from being on the team, Nate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of like I said, the tradition at Yale is so rich. Um, and you feel that just walking around campus, obviously, um, as an academic institution. Uh, it's very palpable and 
uh, you really feel like you're part of something special and you get that same feeling being part of the football program just because it's been around for so long, you know, all the national champions championships and, um, you know, even, even now, you know, we're getting such amazing recruits and the coaching staff has done such a good job and, you know, put us at the top of the league again. And um, it's so fun to watch guys come out. And, you know, like when I, when I was a freshman, uh, we had Eric Johnson and Than Merrill, uh, both of whom went on and got drafted, which was very rare. I think, you know, I don't know um, the, the, the last athlete or the last football player before them to get drafted. And, and coming into a program like Yale, Yale you know, I, I still dreamed of playing in the NFL, uh, like most, you know, young guys that, that grew up in the game do. And I, I knew that uh, at the end of my career, if I was good enough to, to be um, in that position, that I, you know, the, the scouts would still find you. Um, seeing those two guys get drafted my, my freshman year really, um, you know, solidified that in my brain and uh, made it a thing that, you know, I thought was worth pursuing. Um, but at the same time, obviously taking studies seriously and trying to do as well as I could in, in, in school and um, set myself up for the long haul. But um, yeah, I mean, just that tradition is so rich and, uh, and you know, the family, the Yale football family is, is strong and, and it runs deep. So uh, I love, I love that. I, I'm, I'm kind of a junkie for that kind of tradition and uh, there's plenty to, to be had with the Yale Bulldogs. So speaking of traditions, obviously we're we're celebrating all things the game and you and I spoke the other day and I learned that your team didn't exactly fare so well against Harvard in the game while you were there, but perhaps you have a good memory from the game that you can share with us. Yeah. Yeah. So we, my, um, my freshman year, we beat Harvard up at Harvard. Um, we had a, we had a great team. Um, Eric Johnson made in a, the second version of the catch going in. And if people don't know Eric Johnson, he went on to a great pro career himself. Uh, he was a wide receiver at Yale and then ended up playing tight end in the NFL. Um, so that experience was really cool. It was like the last second uh, touchdown we won. I thought we would continue to win um, all of our meetings with Harvard and uh, it went exactly the opposite way. Um, but I, I mean, I always, you know, I will, I will pat myself on the back. I always had some of my best games against Harvard and. Uh, I, you know, I felt like I did my part, but uh, <laughs> um, I think the best memories are just, uh, you know, showing up to the Yale Bowl, running out of the tunnel, and there being, you know, 50,000, 55,000, 60,000 fans, um, and, you know, Yale, Yale fans are great. We have traditionally, you know, maybe 20,000 fans at a game, which, you know, in one double A, is a lot of fans, um, and, you know, I played in front of packed high school stadiums, and, you uh, but th that was a little bit different. They're smaller. The Yale Bowl is massive. You know, it, it, at some point, I think it hosted 80,000 fans and um, they took the, the, the bleachers down off the top and now it's like 60,000 fans. So you put 25,000 people in a 65,000 or 60,000 fan stadium and it looks kind of empty. Um, but then at the end of the year, you had this Harvard game that really felt like a bowl game. Um, and it's fun going back now and experiencing all the things that are going on outside of the, the bowl with the tailgating, uh, you know, everyone comes back and they kind of relive their glory days a little bit. So I think that's what, it, I mean, you know, what an amazing homecoming, what an awesome way to end up uh, every season with kind of a built-in bowl game uh, in the Ivy Leagues. It's pretty special. Yeah, it is. It is very special. And that's what we're all missing very much this year, among other things, which is why we yeah. wanted to talk to football players and cheerleaders and marching band members to kind of relive the glory days. So you touched upon this a little bit, Nate, but can we talk a little bit about your experience being drafted, what it was like going into the NFL after four years at Yale? What was that like for you and your family? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so it was funny. Uh, so I was, I was part of Deke uh, when I was at Yale and every year they have uh, the, uh, the Tang. I, I don't know if they're still doing it, but Tang was a big uh, kind of party in the spring. And it, was, it just so happened to fall on draft weekend. And yeah, I remember kind of sitting in, in one of the houses and uh, sitting around all my guys, like watching this on the second day of the draft and not knowing, you know, if I was gonna get a call. I had a felt, 
I had a feeling I would. Um, we got the call from the Buccaneers and, you know, picked it up and, hey, this is, you know, can you hold for John Gruden? Yeah. Uh, talk to John Gruden. How would you like to be part of the Bucs? I'd love that. Um, and then, you know, hanging up the phone and everyone going crazy and uh, just being there with, you know, all my brothers. Uh, super cool experience. And then, yeah, I mean, back then, I think it was a little bit more rare for guys to, to come out of the Ivy League and go in the NFL. There's there's some really strong players um, in, the, in the NFL right now from the Ivy Leagues. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of guys out there that I could uh, kind of commiserate with. Um, but... I mean, yeah, having that experience and I don't know, people have certain expectations of, of what it means to, to come out of the Ivy League, um, but it was great. I mean, it's, it's a dream come true. Um, you know, I felt like my my experience playing Ivy League football, uh, you know, I, I would say it took a little bit of, um, you know, speed up process to get ready for the NFL, but um, I was fine. Yeah. And uh, had a had a good career and uh, loved every bit of it. So it was cool to be able to, to obviously do both. So you talked about, you know, playing in the bowl and now you're playing in the NFL and these like gigantic stadiums with screaming people. And, and I can't imagine what that was like. So coming from the bowl, did it feel like not nearly as big a difference because the bowl is so amazing or was it a little bit of culture shock for you? Yeah. I mean, the, Obviously, I'd played in huge stadiums, but these stadiums were were much more full on a weekly basis. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's all, it's all great. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think kind of the the coolest experience I had while playing in the NFL was really playing with the 2006 New Orleans Saints team. So that was the year uh, they were they were kind of in 2005. Katrina hit. The team went to San Antonio uh, to, they had to evacuate. The city was devastated. I, I actually joined the Saints the last month of that 2005 season. So I got to experience what it was like for the team being displaced uh, in San Antonio and really just trying to get through the season uh, and then come back the next year. And we brought in Sean Payton and Drew Brees and a bunch of great defensive players and a bunch, you know, and the organization flipped just like that. And it had a lot to do with coaching and mindset. And also had a lot to do with, you know, us feeling like we were part of this rebuilding process for the city of New Orleans. And uh, it was so cool because, you know, the Saints had always been at the bottom of the league, been a struggling organization, but the fans were really strong. And uh, yeah, no one expected us to be any good that year. And we came out and I think we went, we won the first five or six games, ended up in the NFC championship game. I we lost Nate for a second, but hopefully we'll get him back. Oh, no. um, there he goes. Yeah. Okay. We lost you for a second, Nate. Sorry. Yeah, but we we heard we heard oh. a little bit about the Saints and coming back and winning five games, NFC championship. We could pick up right there. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry, maybe I have a bad connection here. Um but yeah, so I was hurt at the end of it. And that was, that's actually kind of what inspired what I'm doing now. Uh, but that was really special to be part of that. And, and kind of the same thing, you know, being part of something or actually helping to create a tradition. Now the Saints are one of the top organizations in the league. Um, so that was really special. And uh, yeah, I love, but, but yeah, being part of those games when the whole stadium is filled and people, you know, their, their mood and their, their uh, livelihood for the week is kind of like, riding on what the, the Saints are doing. So that was that was special. That is a really special place. I actually got to go to a preseason game there a few years ago and it was the energy is unbelievable. So I can only imagine what it was like to be on the field, especially during such a, a crazy time for the city. So Nate, you start you touched upon this, I think, when we lost you a little bit. So football obviously takes a major toll mm -hmm. on your body. And that is kind of what led you to the next stage of your life as an entrepreneur. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh oh, did I lose you again? There we go. Okay. Tell us about Brazen Life, Nate. Sorry, bad connection. This is modern times, I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess going back to what I was saying earlier, so I had that bad back injury. And um, when I was recovering from that, I, I really learned how to use a foam roller, um, a tool that most people know now. Back then, it was uh, a lot of athletes used them, but it wasn't you know, used in the general public a lot. Um, if you don't know, foam roller is just a way to kind of give yourself a self-massage 
you lay on top of it, you roll around, it gives pressure. Um, you can stretch on it, you can work out on it. There's a bunch of things that you can do with a foam roller. And I use it a lot and it actually helped me extend my career five years. Uh, but uh, my issue with it is they're a bulky piece of foam. It's like a six inch cylinder and um, it's hard to put in a backpack or a carry on. Uh, so when you're going you know, to the gym or you're going traveling the world, I, I traveled a bunch, um, you know, for businessmen, if you're, if you're going to, uh, travel for business and you, you get off the plane, a lot of times you're stiff, you're in pain, uh, and you want to recover. Um, I thought it'd be amazing to have a foam roller that I could whip out of my backpack, pop open and, um, and get some recovery and get some pain relief. Uh, and so that idea kind of sat in my brain. And then a couple of years after retiring, I started developing it, um, launched the product, uh, and then, about a year and a half after we launched, uh, we were asked to be on Shark Tank. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was really cool. So obviously Shark Tank is a really well-watched show. People enjoy it for the drama and the excitement. So tell us a little bit about what that experience was like for you and your business partner. Yeah, yeah, I mean, incredible. I, it's uh, it's one of those things that, you know, you you, create something that's innovative and you show it to people and like, oh, you should go on Shark Tank. You're like, yeah, that would be kind of cool. And you laugh about it. Um, we, uh, we have a, an advisor um, that had a connection, uh, a guy that knew a guy that was a producer at Shark Tank. Um, they made the connection just to see if there was any interest there. Uh, got through the process pretty quick. And, you know, I think after the initial call, it was uh, maybe six weeks after that initial phone call, we're standing there in front of our, our you know, panel of sharks uh, and trying to pitch our business idea to the world. And uh, so that happens. And then you don't know if it's going to air uh, and it's, you don't know when it's going to air. Um, so it, it's kind of like this whole process of where you're like trying to figure out and st strategize and plan and get inventory for a potential air date that you don't even know if it's going to happen. And um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in between there. And then towards the end of 2017, uh, we got a call that it was going to be, you know, uh, you know, at the end of October and got ready for that. And yeah, just a, a massive response. And it's a really cool way, um, to obviously get some brand awareness, um, and also try to go and bring on, uh, equity partners that can really, you know, make a difference in your business. Um, so really cool it's it's season nine episode x or six um if anybody wants to take a look or keep an eye out of uh, an eye out for it season nine episode six i just you know i i like watching the show but i get anxious just listening to people give their pitch and <laughs> and you know that it seems so fast and quick and you have to think on your toes i can't even imagine what that was like but that sounds like an absolute blast and you know tell us a little bit about yeah. where you're where the company is at now yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, Shark Tank obviously put a bunch of eyes on the, the business and we've, we've continued to grow since then. Um, we have, so the main product is still right now the, the collapsible foam roller. Uh, and then we are in the process. Uh, so this year has been interesting, right? For everyone uh, with COVID, uh, people stopped traveling. So we saw a little bit of a downturn in our sales for a product that has its core value proposition of traveling, right? Um, but that actually gave us a chance to kind of take a step back and, and think about um, the next set of products that we had talked about for a long time and what we wanted to commit our resources to. And I'm, I'm really, really excited about um, some of the stuff that we have coming out in, in the next couple months. Um, we're gonna launch a couple new products in, in most likely in January. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, one's a massage gun. Um, so if, if anybody out there is in the massage gun market, hold off, you're going to want to see what we have. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll start posting some stuff pretty soon. The other one is a space saving workout bench. So it's going to be for in, in home use. Um, and it just makes it really easy to get a workout in, uh, get set up and then break it down so that you still have uh, space around the house to, to do your other stuff. So Really cool stuff. And then uh, a couple new versions of the roller. Um, and yeah, we, we've got a lot that we've, we've kind of put into and invested, reinvested back into the business so that um, as we kind of come out of this 
coronavirus um, world that we're living in, uh, we'll be we'll be rocking and rolling. That's awesome. This year has been so insane for so many people and for so many different reasons, but it's nice. It is nice to have the opportunity to pivot and reevaluate and figure out how to move forward, which is what we're all doing. So speaking of moving forward, we're coming to the end of our time together. And I'm wondering, Nate, if you have any advice that you would like to impart on Yaleys who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs or football players who may come across this interview and want some advice on what's what's after football. You said that you had always thought about becoming an NFL player and then now you're in life after the NFL. So give us your best bit of advice, Nate. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's not groundbreaking, but I think it's just to go for it. Right. If you have a, a dream, um, chase it. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that was my approach towards the NFL. Uh, you know, coming, coming from the Ivy leagues, it is a little bit more difficult to get there, but I knew it was possible. Um, and so I put in the work to get there to, to make myself ready, uh, to make myself marketable, uh, to NFL teams. Um, and then the same thing with, with uh entrepreneurship it's tough it's hard um you know most most businesses fail most business ideas fail um but you never know unless you try right so um if you can if you can look at the downsides and you're willing to accept um those then then go for it and and don't hold back um because you don't want any regrets you know at the end so like i said not groundbreaking stuff but i i, I truly believe um that's the way to approach life well, it's true. And we hear it time and time again. And, you know, just putting in the work is more than half the battle and having an amazing Yale community to support you is also a major benefit of our Yale family. So Nate, thank you so much for being here with me today and celebrating the pep rally, even though we don't have a game, we do still have our Yale football family and our cheer family and our band family and everybody who always comes out to those tailgates that we are definitely missing this year. So Nate, we wish you the best with Brazen Life. Thank you so much for your time today. And everybody, thanks for watching. We're going to be back later tonight at 730 with Jesse Rising, who started the Warrior Scholar Foundation. We're going to be talking about that later. So Nate, thank you so much. It was great to see you. Thanks everybody thank for watching. So we'll talk to you me. soon. Take care. Bye, everybody.